Brown Chapel Church community. What a blessing it is to be able to one more week come to you via this means. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in and being part of our virtual worship service. I want to start by saying thank you to Bruce for leading us in the morning manna devotional thought. And I also want to say thank you to Elder Nemeth, uh, Scott Nemeth, for leading us in the adult Sabbath school quarterly study. And of course, I want to thank Adiel Pauline Cabrera for leading us in the kids Sabbath school class and Melody Bononwi for leading us in the youth Sabbath school class. And you probably heard the one call now with the announcement, but I want to reemphasize that July 4, July 4, our buildings will be opened again and you will be able to come into our building for an in-person worship service. Now, if for whatever reason you are unable to come in, I know that some of the people that are in this group do not live in Indianapolis. Uh, some of the people that are in this group don't even live in the United States. So we are going to do our very best to continue to maintain online presence and you will be able to see what is going on in the churches via these means. And when we are all up and ready, you will be able to have services from both Brownsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church and Chapel West Seventh-day Adventist Church. But please mark your calendars, those of you that are local and are able to attend our worship services in person. July 4, our buildings will be open. And starting at 930, you will be able to be part of our worship services in person. So that means that we have one more all virtual service that would be next week and the week after that july 4 the first saturday of july you will be able to participate in person and those of you that cannot be there in person you can continue to tune in virtually although it's going to look a little different different we hope to be able to provide something that is still fulfilling i want to say hi to a few people that are tuning in Prevost and family, hey guys, I'm sure the De La Paz are there as well. So glad that you are tuning in. Marianne, good that you are connecting. Mary, glad that you're here with us. The Msumara family, thank you so much. By the way, at the end of the message for the appeal song, there is a special song by Brother Smart Msumara. Thank you so much for sharing that. And our whole church family will be able to enjoy it as well today. Donna, hi, Devi. Glad that you are connecting with us. So, as you've been able to see through the, through the weeks, through the months that we've been doing virtual studies, that no matter where you are, you could be visiting relatives, you can still tune in. You can be out in the park, you can tune in. You are in your house, in front of your telephone, your tablet, your computer, or maybe your television that has... A device connected to it you can still tune in so I hope that you are taking advantage and enjoying that uh, flexibility that we've been having with our virtual services um, and also of course if for whatever reason you uh, tune in a little late all of the messages the Sabbath school for the adults the prayer time the morning manners the sermon time all is archived on our Brown Chapel Facebook group. All you gotta do is, at the top of the group or on the side, look for topics, and then look for the Bible study, adult Sabbath school, or prayers, or sermon time, and you can get this, this um, programming. And I just wanna remind you that today at three, today at three, those that were not able to be part of the live Bible study on the book Steps to Christ, today at 3, the video with the story will air here at Brown Chapel. And you can find the previous two uh, Bible studies. Again, go to Topics and then look for Bible Study Steps to Christ. Click in there and you will be able to get those if you have not yet started watching. And at 2, we continue with our 30-day health challenge 
Let me say hello to a few more people that are connecting. Hi, Daisy and Billy. Glad that you guys are able to tune in. Landon, hey, good to see you, sort of, kind of. Helda, so glad that you are able to connect. Well, I know that you're waiting for this. Every single week, we have a health tip, and today is no different. Charlene Salmon, she is going to be sharing with us a very, very interesting health tip. I hope that you're able to enjoy it. I apologize. I'm having a little a little technical issue here. Let me fix the audio. And that uh, we will be able to then play play the video here. You check all the boxes and then things do not work. How you expect it? Let's see if he's working now. Good morning, Brown Chapel there Virtual Church. Today you've caught me in my somewhat messy sewing room. I'm just here working on a new mask. Yeah, it's hard to believe this so we've all lived in this so-called new normal of COVID for over three months now. I know the uncertainty of these times has led to stress and anxiety for most people. So in today's health tip segment, I want to share what I think is some very interesting information. Some of my Chapel West friends knew my mom. She was a very fulfilled person. She was a nurse, so she used both her brain and her hands to take care of patients. At home, she was always sewing, crocheting, quilting, knitting, canning, or making breads, pies. And fortunately, she passed a lot of these skills on to me. But now, I really think she was onto something. And that something was the hand-brain connection and its role in our overall mental health. Right before the COVID shutdown, I was looking through some employee enrichment materials at work and found a very interesting video about the hand-brain connection. The researchers in this video pointed out that our brains have more neurons dedicated to controlling our hands than anything else in the body. They concluded that using our hands for work and creating things was good for our brains and mental health. And they don't mean this kind of hand-brain activity. I found this to be so fascinating and I looked more into it. Kelly Lambert is a neuroscientist at the University of Richmond and she's done extensive research into this hand-brain mental health connection. She has found that moving, using our hands for work, hobbies, and creativity actually changes the neurochemicals in our brain in a similar fashion as drugs we sometimes take to change neurochemicals. Many medications for anxiety and depression work by increasing dopamine or serotonin, neurotransmitters important in mental health. Kelly has termed, coined the, the term of using behavioral suticals to describe this increase in well-being brain chemicals. Perhaps behavioral suticals can be helpful instead of or along with pharmaceuticals. To put it really simply, doing things with your hands can make your brain and you happier. Doctors actually intuitively knew this way back in the 19th century. Doctors would prescribe knitting to women with anxiety. It was relaxing. What was really going on here? The repetitive movements of knitting increased the neurochemicals in the brain and the creative product that resulted was rewarding. There's a connection between using both hands, being creative, being physically engaged, and that is good for your brain and can lead to better mental health. Dr. Lambert put her theories to the test using rats. She had a group of rats she called trust fund rats. You know, those spoiled little rats that never had to work for anything, thought life just owed them. She gave those little rats all their little bitty treats. But she had another group of rats that had to dig for their treats, had to put a little elbow grease into it to get their, their rewards. Guess what? The trust fund rats showed signs of increased stress hormones while the rats that used their little hands and got down to business and worked for their treats had signs of better mental health. So how can you engage your hand-mind connection and maybe lower those stress hormones, 
kick in your behavior pseudicals and lower anxiety in these hard times. Uh, back to my mom. This is where I think she intuitively knew something. Learn a new craft like needlepoint, woodworking, art, knitting or crocheting, sewing, or metalwork. Perhaps get out in the garden, use those hands and get a little dirty. Take up scrapbooking, origami, or journaling, or try some new recipes in the kitchen. There are plenty of books and online resources to get you started. I get really excited at the Goodwill when I find books like this. Or I like to do a new project using techniques like this. These were little squares and it was totally different. If I get stuck, I just find a YouTube resource to guide me through. Doing new projects and stitches helps to keep my brain active and hopefully make fresh behavior suitables. And especially use those two hands in that brain and give thanks to God for his gifts and blessings even in these hard times. Remember, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Psalm 90, 17. Thank you so much, Charlene, for that wonderful thing. Wasn't that very interesting? Uh, using our hands can help us. So now you know. So gardening would be great. Uh, anything that involves you uh, actively using your hands other than just being in front of a computer. And I know that's kind of hard for me to say right now because we're all in front of a computer right now, but... The day is longer than just our worship service, so I hope that at the end of the service, you can have fun doing something with your hands. Let me say hello to a few more people that are tuning in. Aquila, Alvina, Crawford, hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Paula, so glad that you're here with us. Justin, hey. Justine, uh, so glad that you're here with us. Kalita, say hi to Merlin also. Caleb and Tina, hey guys, so glad that you're here with us. Carol, so glad that you were able to connect. Ah, beautiful day. It's, it really is a beautiful day um, outside. Of course, you can't see through the windows, but I can see just the bright uh, brightness of the day coming in. So I hope that you're able to not just enjoy today, but also in the morning, but also enjoy a wonderful afternoon. And yes, parents, it is that time. It is that times where we all gather as a family around whatever device you're using, your cell phone, your computer, your TV, your tablet, for the children's story. We have a treat today by our very own Melissa Gugu from Brownsburg. She's going to be sharing the children's story. So please, please, if your kids are not watching with you, please go ahead and grab them. And you know how it is, you have a few minutes, rather a few seconds to get them as we listen to Scott Michael Bennett. Hello boys and girls, happy Sabbath. I hope you're all staying safe and staying at home and listening to your parents. Yes. Um, today's story is going to come from Matthew chapter 19. 
So it says that Jesus was coming from Galilee and he was in Judea, just across the Jordan River. And he was praying for people, healing people, teaching them about the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, people had questions. He was answering questions, casting out demons. Um, and he was with his disciples. Um, we know Jesus' disciples, right? Well, I hope we do. If we don't, we need to learn about them. So um, he was with his disciples. And the crowd, they brought kids over to Jesus and put them on his lap. And the disciples got grumpy and they were like, no, no, take these kids away. Take the kids away. And Jesus was like in Matthew 19 verse 14, he said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So from this verse, I have learned that heaven and church and Jesus is not just for adults, is not just for the pastor, is not just for the elder, is also for us, the little ones. So if you feel like you want to tell the world about Jesus, that's a good thing. I encourage you to do it. Let's go ahead and do it because we are also princes and princesses of heaven. Jesus said so. So if somebody asks you, why are you saying you're a prince of heaven? Tell them Jesus said so in Matthew 19 verse 14. Well, that is the end of our story. I hope you guys have a good and a great Sabbath and enjoy. Thank you, Melissa, for that wonderful story. Isn't that amazing? We can learn as we look at the life of the disciples of Jesus. Hey, kids, by the way, if you haven't learned, if you have not learned a lot about if you have not learned a lot about the disciples of Jesus, just stick around for the message today. And we are going to be learning about some of the disciples and friends of Jesus. Now, I know that you enjoy that children's story. Thank you, Melissa. So let's share our loves. Just go ahead and in your device, just type, thank you, Melissa. And if you've been enjoying the health tips, share the love too. And just go ahead and type, Thank you, Charlene, for the health tip that you share with us today. Let me say hello to a few more people that are tuning in. Jerry, hey, so glad that you're connecting with us. Thank you for the music submission that you made. That's coming up in just a little bit. Glaxon family, hey, Ethan, so glad that you are able to tune in. And also we have the Wall family. Hey, guys, Bob, Nicole, Joshua, thank you so much for connecting. Well, we are going to continue with our program, and now is that time when we do our music. Now, I know that last week we had an, a very creative, very creative uh, duo or duet, and just when you think that our young people have, you know, reached the top of their creativity, we get a trio. So please uh, tune in as we enjoy music this Sabbath by Wendy Kleintank. The video was edited by Kittery Boyk. And we're also going to be enjoying music by Sally, Monica, Raquel, and Michelle. Here is our praise and worship time. <laughs>
so much for Wendy and Kiri for that creativity not two but three of Wendy and she was not just playing the violin in two different ways but she was also singing that's just incredible Wendy thank you so much for blessing us with your gift of music uh, for choosing to share that with us and thank you the Clinton for delivering that to us I hope that we can continue to see more of you. And if you're ever in the area visiting your grandpa, please let us know. We would love to hear you live at one of our churches. And thank you so much to Sally, Monica, Raquel, and Michelle for that wonderful rendition of There is a River. It was just music to all of our ears so church family don't be shy i saw that some of you are already sharing your love but please continue to do that if you were blessed with the music that you just experienced go ahead take to your devices and type your appreciation to each of the people that were singing and again that was wendy and her sister edited the video uh, Kittery, and then we had Sally, Monica, Raquel, and Michelle. Well, now it's time for us to dive into the word. But I see that there are some people that are still tuning in. 
and I want to say hello to a very special member of our church family, and her name is Pat. Now, Pat, you know that you're special in many ways, but to me particularly, because you were my very first baptism inside one of our church buildings in Brownsburg Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, since I came here to the district. So, Pat, so glad that you're able to tune in. Let me put the title slide up in the screen. The title of the message today is We Are One. Now, before we dive into the word, I would like us to bow our head wherever you are, bow our head and let us pray together. The Heavenly Father, here we are, willing, thankful to be able to have the opportunity, the blessing to share your word. Just thankful because in spite of the pandemic, we can connect with our church family through these means. And the privilege that they're giving me to open your word to them week after week, it's just been amazing. And the love that I have received through the interactions um, that different people um, put in every week to make this virtual service possible, that thank you so much. But that as I, as I open your word, I want to ask that you would be the one leading, that, that the message is yours, not mine. And yeah, I put some notes together and, and uh, I've been feeling you moving me in one particular direction, Dad, but, but if, if you want to make any changes, just make them. Allow for me not to see that on the notes, not to remember that part. And put in me anything new that was not in the notes that you need our church family to hear. That we are your children and we want to experience your blessing. Please use me at this moment as I open your word to a Brown Chapel church community. Pray these things in Jesus' name and may your will be done. Amen. We are one. Not many, not a bunch of people, we're one. Now, what am I talking about? Okay, let's go to the Bible. Look at this verse, John 10, 16. It's, it's, the, it's the Bible text for today. It says, and other sheep I have. Jesus is the one talking. And he says, and other sheep I have, which are not of these four. Them also must bring and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Now, if you're old school, uh, you know, it's on the screen, but if you're old school, just go ahead and grab your paper Bibles if you're old school. If you're not old school, you're fine with technology. It's all good. But if you're old school, go ahead and grab your paper Bibles, and we're going to read it. Um, it's always good every once in a while to make sure that, uh, you know, everything was typed correctly. So let's go to John. That's the fourth gospel. So the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So this is John 10, verse 16. John 10, verse 16. And I'm reading from the New Kings, New King James uh, version of the Bible. And this particular Bible happens to be the, the Andrew Study Bible, which is the New King James version of the Bible. And it's got some notes in the bottom by Bible scholars. So John 10, 16 says this. And again, Jesus is the one talking. He says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So, did you catch, did you catch that, church family? We, we are one. We are not a bunch of people. We're not just a random group of people coming together. We are one, one flock, Jesus' flock, he's the shepherd. Through the message today, we're going to talk about Jesus' disciples and closest friends. Just so that you 
feel a little more assured that even though we may not be perfect, we are still that one flock. I have a friend in Michigan in the St. Joseph's Seventh Avenue Church, which is where I served as a student pastor when I was at seminary. His name is Eric Tillman, and from time to time he sent me uh, messages or videos be a Facebook messenger and he sent me this particular this particular story that I want to share with you because I found the message to be really powerful and uh, if you can see on the screen there there's a there's a picture there and that's the very first picture of this story so hopefully you can follow along and I don't mess it up. <laughs> but if you put a basketball in my hand, if you put a basketball in my hand, it will be worth about maybe maybe $15, right? The price value of it at the store, right? <laughs> I really cannot do much. I want to spin it, but it won't work. About $15. But if you put that same basketball in the hand of LeBron James, it's worth about 30 to 40 million dollars. If you put a football in my hand, sorry, didn't have one. If you put a football in my hand, it's worth 10 to 20 bucks. But if you put that same football in the hand of Peyton Manning, it's worth 50 to 60 million dollars. Yes, this was intentional. He's wearing the Colts colors. I know there's some of you Indiana fans watching right now. In my hands of football, just a few dollars, right? But in the hand of Peyton Manning, 50 to 60 million dollars. See, it depends on whose hands it's in. If you take a golf club, you take a golf club and you put it in my hands, it's worth about 50 dollars. This is uh, part of my wife's set. I guess now you know she's a golfer. Well, she likes to play. Um, worth about $50. But if you take that same golf club and you put it in the hands of Tiger Woods, it's worth $80 million. Now, I know some of you World travelers, you want to see this one, right? If you take a soccer ball or a football and you put it in my feet, it's worth maybe 10 bucks. But if you put that same soccer ball in the feet of um, Lionel Messi, it's worth about $400 million. That's just an estimation of his net worth. Um, he averages about $410,000 a week. Incredible, right? If you take a tennis racket, some tennis balls, right? You put them in my hand, they would be worth about, I don't know, $25, $35, depending on the cost of the racket and uh, the tennis balls. By the way, this is my first and only tennis racket. I bought this in the, my freshman year of college. That would have been 1998, 1999 for my tennis class. Can you believe that? They give you college credit to take tennis. Oh, well. So if you put this in my hands, even after my college class, it's not going to be worth more than 40 bucks. But if you put the same racket in the hands of Serena Williams, it would be worth $8 million a year. Did you catch that? $8 million a year. Never seen that much money in my life. If you take a stick and you put it in my hands, maybe I can, I can fend off a wild animal coming at me or I can help myself walk along. But if you take that same stick or rod and you put it in the hands of Moses, he can part the Red Sea. 
If you take a slingshot and you put it in my hands, it would become nothing but a child's toy. But if you take a slingshot and you put it in the hands of King David, he slays a giant with it. See, it depends on whose hand it's in. If you take five loaves of bread and two fish and you put it in my, in my hands, I have a nice meal, maybe some leftover. But if you put five loaves of bread and two fishes in the hands of Jesus, he feeds thousands and have 12 baskets full of leftovers. Wow. It depends in whose hand it's in. If you take a couple of nails and you put them in my hands, there's really not much that I can do it with it. But if I have a hammer <laughs> and some wood, maybe I can build a bear house. Or maybe I can just nail down a piece of wood. But if you take the same nails and you put it in the hands and feet of Jesus, it leads to salvation and eternal life for those who believe in Him. See, it depends on whose hands and feet it's in. That's what makes the difference. If you take your troubles and your worries, all they're going to do is stress and overwhelm you. But if you take those same troubles and those same worries and you place them in the hands of Jesus, He will lead you through it. But remember, it depends on whose hands it's in. So why not give everything that you have to God? Give everything that you have to Jesus. Surrender your worries and your troubles and your fears to the Holy Spirit and let Him handle it for you. Incredible, right? When you put something of very little value in the hands of someone that knows what to do with it, it gains incredible value. So let's go back to our verse. And other sheep, Jesus says, I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. I, I, I want to drive that point. One flock. We are one. We're not just a bunch of random people grouped together separately. We are one. Because we are under one shepherd. And his name is Jesus. There's a statement in the Signs of the Time that I would like to read, and it says this. In the East, it is the custom of the shepherd to name his sheep, and as the sheep learn their names, they respond to the voice of the shepherd. The shepherd goes before them and leads them out, guiding them from the fall to the pasture. The sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd and follow him, Jesus declared himself to be the true shepherd because he gave his life for the sheep. So when we look at Jesus as the one shepherd of the one flock, this isn't something that randomly Jesus ascribed to himself. He gave his life to be able to become that one shepherd that has the answers to your problems, that has the answers to your need, that is able to help you, does not matter what you're going through. He died for you. He died for me. 
and that is evidence that he can help because he did not remain in the grave but he resurrected the statement continues to say he says therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again no man taketh it from me but I lay it down of myself so the sacrifice that Jesus made on your behalf was a willing sacrifice he was not forced to do it I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again this commandment has I ha have I received from my father we're one one shepherd one flock one people but I know I know that perhaps you're thinking like sometimes I'm thinking but man whew, some of the people in that flock I don't know I mean their behavior is at best questionable and at worst undesirable maybe not all the time but sometimes are they also part of the flock maybe you've been there maybe you did something and the rest of the people around you were not very pleased with you and maybe you wonder yourself am I really part of the flock that one flock that Jesus described or am I from those that are not yet in and he's gonna call in well when when Jesus ordered the words that we were able to read in John 10 verse 16 he had a close group of friends they're identified or referred to in scripture as his disciples and I would like us to just go through scripture and take small glimpses at some of these disciples and his close friends aside from the disciples just to see what they were like now mind you this is not who they were their whole life this is not who they were all the time but these are aspects of their character these are behaviors that they exercise during their interactions with uh, Jesus and the reason why I want us to look at them is because when we look at these characteristics we're going to realize that you know we're all in this together but we need to remember that we're one okay so let's start with Peter so Peter Peter was actually temperamental he was temperamental look at this then he began to curse and swear saying I do not know the man immediately a rooster crow maybe you remember the story maybe you haven't read it but this particular verse is what happens after Jesus told Peter that he was going to deny him three times and he's there because he was kind of following at a distance when they took Jesus ca Jesus's, Jesus capture and some people began to say that he was one of the followers of Jesus and this is how he tries to fool them into them thinking that he's not he began to swear curse have you ever been next to a, a Christian and and you hear this foul disgusting language coming out of them and you wonder are they Christian are they part of that one fold well, Peter did it and uh, not only that he got kind of violent in fact there's a story when they're coming to take Jesus capture where Peter just slice off the right ear of Marcus but don't take my word for it here's the verse then Simon Peter having a sword drew it and struck the high priest servant and cut off his right ear the servant's name was Marcus Wow, so Peter was temperamental, foul language, even violence. There's another disciple, his name was Thomas. Maybe you know him as Doubting Thomas. And the reason why he sometimes is referred to as Doubting Thomas is because 
After Jesus resurrected, he appeared to his disciples, but Thomas wasn't there. And then the disciples, the rest of the disciples that saw Jesus, they tell him about him. And he's like, nah, mm -mm. until I see the nail prints in his hands and I'm able to touch the side, you know, where they spear him, I'm not going to believe. So Thomas was a doubter. He doubted the word about Jesus of his fellow disciples. But in time, he saw Jesus. And uh, yeah, you guessed it. He had to eat all those words. Because Jesus really had resurrected and appeared to, the, uh, to his fellow disciples. Now, let's go to the Bible and read it. Okay. Now, Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see his hands, in his hands the, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into the, his side, I will not believe. Now, if you keep reading the story, he felt really bad. He didn't want to like touch the holes of where Jesus was pierced. He was just saying that because he just didn't believe. Have you ever met somebody like that? It's like you feel that God is talking to you. He's, he's revealing something incredible to you. And you want to share it with your fellow believer, your brother or your sister. And when you share the words that you know that came from Jesus, they're like, I, nah, 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 I don't buy it. I don't believe that. And maybe when you have those interactions, you wonder, you know, are these people even Christians? Well, Thomas was a doubt. Now, this one you're going to like. This is a couple of brothers, uh, James and John. Now, interestingly enough, these two brothers received a nickname. Now, when you read the story, and we're going to read the passage, you're going to see that Jesus is the one that gave him the nickname. This is in, in the passage where Jesus is naming his 12 disciples. And he says, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave, that he is Jesus, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. By the way, that word, Boanerges, I was reading the Essay Bible Commentary, and likely this is a transliteration from the Aramaic. Um, and... That's why in the text you also have the definition of the word, which is sons of thunder. Now, maybe you read that sons of thunder, you're like, well, that's not that bad. I mean, they're loud. And they only happen when there is a storm. But maybe that's not that bad. Well, let's keep reading so that we can see why is that they had this interesting nickname. Luke 9, 49 and 54. Now John answered and said, this is John, remember? James, John, two brothers, sons of Zebedee. Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. Whoo! Now he's getting personal, right? Because you know you've been there, right? You've been there. You looked at people in other faith traditions. Or you look at people in your same faith tradition, but in another group, you know, a church that has a different name because maybe they're in a different community. Maybe they look different, right? And you see them doing things and you're like, uh-uh, they're not going to be doing that thing in the name of Jesus. It's like, who do these people think they are? They don't follow the one through God. Well, if you ever wonder, are those people really believers? Well, look who would chant. Look at what John did. That's why they were called the sons of thunder. But yes, it gets worse. Verse 54. You can, in your leisure time, just read the whole passage. But verse 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, and by the way, the, the setting here, just so you know, Jesus is, 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 is going to a particular town. And uh, he wanted to be received, and he sent messengers ahead, and, and they did not want to receive him, right? 
So it's like they refuse to do this favor. And uh, when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? <laughs> oh, oh, did you catch this? James and John are asking Jesus if he wants them to kill the people with fire that refuse to do a favor for Jesus and his disciples, which includes them. Have you ever been around those people? I mean, come on. They truly are the sons of thunder. They're, they're not just like, like passively showing displeasure. I mean, they want to put the fear of God in the people that don't do things their way. They want to put some good hurting on them because, you know, they had it coming. Because if they were really Christians, they would not be behaving in that way. You ever wonder if those people, you know, if they're Christians? Not the ones we are accusing of misbehaving, but the one doing the accusing? Well, James and John. By the way, James and John are one of the three closest disciples of Jesus. Peter, James, John. A small group within the small group of the twelve. And this is what they were like. Now, it wasn't all bad. You're probably thinking it's all bad. No. We have Andrew, that's Peter's brother. We have Philip. These guys, these guys were soul winners. Look, John 1, 40 to 42. One of the two who heard John speak, follow him. And follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. They heard John speaking about Jesus and then they followed Jesus. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, Messiah, which is translated the Christ, which means the anointed one. So, probably the very first follower of Jesus would have been Andrew. And what did he do? He went ahead and recruited someone else to become a follower of Jesus. In other words, he made a disciple of Jesus. This is so winning. This is what we are all about as a church, right? So Andrew, although he's not talked about much in scripture, you have this really incredible description of him. He was a soul winner. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you're Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. So Andrew was a soul winner. Now let's see about Philip, John 1, 45. Philip found Nathanael. So Philip found Jesus, and then he goes and finds Nathanael and said to him, We have found him who Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So Andrew and Philip, they were so winning. You ever meet people like that? In church? In your sphere of friends? And aren't they, like, pleasant to be around? So you have this mix with the disciples of Jesus. Sons of thunder, temperamental, doubters. But then you also have soul winners. Now, before you get too excited, um, the soul winners are also the ones that they can, they can not share what they have encountered. So if they had it, an amazing time in their devotional time that morning with Jesus, you're going to hear about it. So, yes, yeah, sometimes you might even find the soul winners overwhelming because they're always talking about Jesus. But please, don't get me wrong. That's an amazing quality to have. Now, Nathaniel was a questioner. Look at what the Bible says. John 1.46. And Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. You ever meet people like that? You know, it's like they question everything. It's like everything. You, you can never satisfy their question. Why are you doing that? Why are we doing it that way? Can't we just do it this way instead? 
and you wonder, oh man, if you are in administrative committees and you have questioners, trust me when I tell you those are interesting meetings because something that could take three minutes, 30 seconds to be decided upon now takes 30 minutes because there's like a question and then another question and another question. It could get annoying and perhaps you wonder, do these person ever understands why we exist as a church well guess what Nathaniel one of Jesus' closest people one of the 12 disciples he was a questioner ha huh. and Matthew Levi Matthew Levi he was a tax collector Look what the Bible says and Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. So Matthew was a tax collector. And in this particular time in, in the history of, of God's people, tax collecting was not viewed upon favorably. Uh, this was something that was often done by, by the Israelite or Jewish community to the people but it was done on behalf of the Roman Empire which were the oppressors so I guess the closest the closest that we have to that now would be like the IRS you know at the end of the year they come collecting and if you don't have the money you're not super happy uh, but tax collectors in this particular time in history and place in the world had the reputation of being thieves they would they would collect more than they were supposed to be collecting, they would send what was due to the empire and pocket the rest. So, have you ever met anyone in your own church family, in your own community, in your own family, who has questionable ethics? Matthew, he was one of those. And Judas, this guy, he likely was the worst of all. Judas was a traitor. The Bible says that he actually sold Jesus out. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him, deliver Jesus to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time he saw opportunity to betray Jesus. Judas was a traitor. He sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. What is that? For somebody who, who's teaching you, for somebody who's willing to give his life for you, for somebody whom you've seen do incredible miracles, for somebody who is bringing salvation into your life. And then, he turn him in with a kiss which is supposed to be a, a, an act of affection reserved for family closest of friends and 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 uh, and, and your spouses and eh, depending in some cultures they just use it to say hello but for the most part he sold him out the bible says clearly now his betrayer has given them a signal saying, Whoever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away. Luke 22, 48. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? I don't even know if I should ask you if you have people in your sphere of influence in your church that are traitors that with their actions they betray the very the very foundation of what Jesus came to establish when he established the Christian community but if you wonder if those people are part of that one flock think of Judas Judas was part of the 12 now Jesus had a group of very close friends, two sisters and a brother, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And Martha was a distracted complainer. Look at what the Bible says, Luke 10:40. But Martha was distracted with much serving, 
And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister had left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Oh, man. Those got to be the people that get on your nerves. Come on now. The people that, you know, they're, instead of mining about the main thing, they mine about the side things. And then if you're not with them in focusing on the side things, they complain because you are not helping. And if you're wondering, could those people be in that one flock? Well, this was one of Jesus' closest friends. Mary, the Bible says, had a very, very good quality. Luke 10.39. And she had a sister, so Martha had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his voice. Ah, so this is just someone who, who tries to utilize, to maximize her time to learn from Jesus. This is someone who is constantly a lure. Beautiful quality. Now Lazarus, Lazarus was sickly. He had poor health. I know this because Lazarus in John um, 11, we read that he was sick and then he passed away. Let's go to John. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. So Lazarus was a sickly person who then died. Now again, I'm not saying that his whole life he was like this, but this is a moment in his life, that's how he was. Are there people in your church that are constantly sick. In fact, they are so constantly sick that it becomes wearing on you because you're constantly hearing them saying, I'm in the hospital. You're constantly hearing them saying, oh, I'm sorry, um, can you cover for me? Because I'm not feeling well today. And and you feel as if they are using their sickness as, a, as an excuse to get away from their responsibilities. And perhaps you wonder, do they really want to be here? I mean, seriously, why do they even take on responsibilities if they're not going to be able to fulfill them? Because they're sick all the time. Well, guess what? In this particular time in history, the man was the big provider for the family. And the Bible does not tell us that Mary or Martha or, or Lazarus, from that matter, were Mary, which means that very possible Lazarus was the provider for his sisters. So when he dies, it becomes a major inconvenience for them because now they have to fend for themselves alone in a society that really is not set up to allow for women to fend for themselves alone and prosper. See, if you're wondering, if you're wondering, are these kind of people part of that one flock? Are they really one of us? Lazarus was sickly. He died. Now the good news is that Jesus brought him back to life. See, Jesus is the answer to whatever your problem is. But please know that we are all, that we, we all have our challenges, but we're all in this together. We all have our challenges, but we are all in this together. Look at this verse in Romans. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more hardly than he ought to, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. See, we need to come to that point that we realize that we are one. We are one body. We are as important as the person next to us, regardless of the visibility. By that I mean 
Some people may be engaged in a ministry where they are in front all the time. Well, that does not make them more important than me. Some people may live a particular life that, that is a little easier than other people. Well, that does not make them more important than me. We are all one flock, one family, one group of people, Jesus' children. And we do not need to let our privileges that sometimes we experience in life get to our head and think that them in any way make us superior to someone else. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. See? One body, multiple pieces, all necessary and essential to be able to carry out the mission. Now, that means that we need to support each other. So if I'm good right now and you're not, then I'm good so that I can help you. And if tomorrow I'm bad and you're good, you're good so that you can help me. And I'm not just talking about things. It could be behaviors. I'm going through a struggle. You're not. That means that God is equipping you to help me. And until we realize that we're all in this together and that we need to be willing to help each other at all times, we're not hasting the coming of Jesus. We're delaying it by our behavior. There's a story. It took place in... 1968, the Olympics in, uh, um, in New Mexico. The Olympics in New Mexico. And uh, these were like runners, and they decided to take a stand. Uh, Carlos and Tommy, they decided to take a stand. And they decided to take a stand for social equality. And when they won, their, their medals, gold and bronze, they stood when they're being recognized. They had a black glove in their hands and they raised their fist as one for social equality. Now, what is interesting is the person that was in number two, the silver man. His name, his name is Peter Norman, and he was Australian. In fact, to this day, he still has a record in track as the fastest Australian man. It's like uh, 20 seconds and something. It was like a sprint. And uh, he actually, even though he didn't have to, even though he couldn't just simply say that's your struggle, not mine. That's your fight, not mine. He decided to stand with his fellow runners. And uh, he wanted to do exactly what they were doing. But the day of the event, they, they, you know, Carlos and Tommy, they realized that they, they didn't have, they didn't have, they only had two gloves. Not two pairs, just two gloves. So each of them just put one on each hand. And that's why you saw them, right? On the statue, you saw them with the black glove. And that. They only had two gloves. But they also had an, a little pin that talked about their struggle, talked about their, their, their desire for, for racial equality. And uh, Peter actually got to work one of those in his chest. And perhaps you're thinking, oh, no big deal. Well, that's nice. Good for him. Well, that act of brotherhood cost him his Olympic career. When he returned back to Australia, his government was so upset at what he has done that they, for decades, Wipe him out from the annals of history. They wiped him out. 
the next year, even though the next year, sorry, the next Olympic, even though he qualified for the pre qualifiers, and even though he held the record for the fastest runner in Australia, he was not invited. He was not invited to participate in his national team. All because he stood for what was right. It wasn't until decades later that they finally wrote him back into history. See, it cost, it cost to stand for what is right. It cost, Peter, a career as a runner. He never ran again in the Olympics after 1968, even though physically he was more than capable, not just to run, but to win. He was never invited back. But in standing with his fellow runners, he gained two brothers. And when he passed away, the two of them were pallbearers as they carry him to his final resting place. It costs to stand for what is right. But just because it costs doesn't mean we don't do it. It costs Jesus, his life, to save yours. Listen to this statement. I'm gonna, I know I'm, I'm going over time here, so I'm going to read as fast as I can. But you can, you can see it also on the screen. He says, As trials taken around us, both separation and unity will be seen in our ranks. Some who are now ready to take up weapons of warfare will in time of real peril make it manifest that they have not built upon the solid rock they will yield to temptation. Those who have had great light and precious privileges but have not improved them will under one pretext or another go out from us. Not having received the love of the truth, they will be taken in the delusions of the enemy. They will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and will depart from the faith. But on the other hand, when the storm of persecution really breaks upon us, the true sheep will hear the true shepherd's voice. Self-denying efforts will be put forth to save the lost, and many who have strayed from the fall will come back to follow the great shepherd. The people of God will draw closer and present to the enemy a united front in view of the common peril strife for supremacy will cease. There will be no disputing as to who shall be accounted greatest. No one of the true believers will say, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. The testimony of one and all will be, I cleave unto Christ, I rejoice in Him as my personal Savior. The love of Christ, the love of our brethren will testify to the world that we have been with Jesus and learned of Him, then will the message of the third angel swell to a loud cry, and the whole earth will be lighted with the glory of the Lord. Did you catch this? What identify us to the world is having the love of Christ in us. And what is the love of Christ? It's a love that is so deep that he was willing to die for you. He was willing to die so that you can live. So please keep this verse in your mind. Make every effort, every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy without holiness. No one will see the Lord. So now we come to that point in the message when I ask you a question. <clears throat> and it's a very simple question. Are you willing to be part of Jesus' flock? You who saw through the many scriptures in glimpses of the closest friends and followers of Jesus, 
that that one flock is not perfect but even in their imperfections they have one common thread they have one shepherd and they know his voice and they heed his call so i would like to ask you are you willing to be part of jesus's flock if you're willing to be part of jesus's flock in whatever device you're using look for the comments and type we are one and you can do so as we listen to this song <laughs> smart for that beautiful song are you ready for Jesus to come let's uh, let's read that last verse let's read that last verse uh, one more time in Hebrews 12 14 Hebrews is uh, it's in the New Testament 
Hebrews 12, 14. If you have your paper Bibles, just go there with me or in whatever Bible that you, whatever type of Bible that you have, paper or digital, Hebrews 12, 14. It says this, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the law pursue peace with all people God wants us to be one family and it's very simple to be part of Jesus' flock all that you have to do is choose to follow him and in doing so let's keep those words in our minds pursue peace with all people it's time that we leave our differences aside it's time that we leave our pepites aside it's time that we leave our prejudices our, our our discriminatory views and anything that does not hold us together aside and become one flock on the one shepherd jesus christ so i'm going to ask you again are you willing to be part of jesus's flock if you are I would like to have a word of prayer with you. And I would like that to be personal. I'm going to pray here generally, but I also would like the prayer to be personal. So just go to your device, if you haven't already, and type, We Are One. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you because we have an opportunity today to be different to be truly your children to put aside anything and everything that divides us and focus on the one who unites us on jesus on your son that many people typed already we are one and with that statement they're saying i want to be part of that one fall I want to be part of that one family of Jesus where there is no differences among people based on color, based on race, based on language, based on gender. We're just simply one. And that I pray that you will be with each of us who made that commitment to be one, that you, was, that you would equip us to be one. That you would remove from us anything that prevents us from being one. And that you will allow us to be one family under your son Jesus. We pray because we know that we're weak. Because we know that we're going to, to fall by the wayside on our own. Because we know that we will fail on our own. But we also know that with you, we can overcome. With you, we can overcome our internal struggles. And be the people that you have called us to be. So that I pray that you be with each person that wrote, we are one. And that you would help us to be part of your flock. We pray this in Jesus' name and may your will be done. Amen. Brown Chapel Church community, thank you so much for tuning in. Have a blessed rest of the Sabbath. God bless you.